eternal and everlasting God. We thank you, Lord, for this yet another formal opportunity to preach and to teach your gospel. I ask now, Lord, that you stand up in me, and that your word may be taught, that your word may be learned, and that your word may be applied. Speak now, Lord, for your servants are listening. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. First Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 26. Now when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid on the Najab and Ziglag. They had attacked Ziglag, burned it down and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed none of them, but carried them off and went their way. When David and his men came to the city, they found it burned down and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive. Ahinoham of Jezreel and Abigail the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was in great danger for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in spirit for their sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David said to the priest Abiathar, son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? He answered, pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. So David set out, he and the 600 men who were with him. They came to Wadi Basor, where those who stayed were left behind. But David went on with the pursuit. He and 400 men, 200 stayed behind, too exhausted to cross the Wadi Basor. In the open country, they found an Egyptian and brought him to David. They gave him bread and he ate. They gave him water to drink. They also gave him a piece of fig cake and two clusters of raisins. When he had eaten, his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days or three nights. Then David said to him, to whom do you belong? Where are you from? He said, I'm a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amicalite. My master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. We made a raid on the Negev of Cherethites and that which belongs to Judah and the Negev of Caleb and we burned Ziglag down. David said to him, will you take me down to this raiding party? He said, swear to me by God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master and I will take you down to them. When he had taken them down, they were spread out all over the ground, eating and drinking and dancing, because a great amount of spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not one of them escaped, except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back everything. David also captured all of his flocks and herds, which were driven ahead of the other cattle. People said, this is David's spoil. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left behind at the Wadi Basor. They went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. When David drew near the people, he, he saluted them. 
than all the corrupt and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David. He said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may take his wife and children and leave. But David said, you shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and handed us over to this raiding party that attacked us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For the share of the one who goes into the battle shall be the same as the share of the one who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. From that day forward, he made a statue and an ordinance for Israel. It continues to this present day. When David came back to Ziglag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, here's a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. I want to put it all together and use for a subject how to succeed in 2020. How to succeed in 2020. As we end another year and begin a new year, it's natural for us to go into a time of reflection, a time of reminiscing, and a time of looking back. Because all we need to do is turn on any TV station or radio station. And we'll see that we're programmed to look back and to think about the top stories and the top songs of this past year. Remembering the highlights and the lowlights of what happened around the world. Remembering those who have gone on to glory and are no longer on this side of heaven. And I want to suggest to us that whenever we go into a time of reflection and a period of remembrance, that eventually our reflection and our remembrance ought to lead to some rejoicing because it shouldn't take, for, take months for us to think back on 2019 and to find an amen somewhere. That's why every morning Sports Center comes up with the top 10 sports plays from the night before. And they count down the different moments that happen on the field or on the court. So every morning they pull out the highlights of the top 10 moments in sports. And I want to submit to us that if we pulled up the top things that God did for us just yesterday, and count down his top moments from 2019 that nobody ought to make you say amen. Because when we think, we ought to thank. When we remember, we ought to rejoice. When we consider what could have been, we ought to celebrate. Because our reflection ought to lead to our rejoicing. But our reflection ought to lead to some resolutions and some decisions and some quests to change our lives. Because if I can tell the whole truth this morning, I found out in 2019 that every day wasn't hallelujah and thank you, Jesus. And I had some top 10 highlights, and I had some not so top 10 highlights. I had some high moments and some low moments, because some of us never would have thought that we lose some things that we lost. Some of us never would have thought that people would do some things that they did. Some of us never would have thought that we'd be laid off from that job. Some of us never would have thought that friendship relationship would end. Some of us never would have thought that we had to cut some people off. And somebody knows that last year didn't always have some top 10 highlights. Because y'all, there's some things that I don't ever, ever, ever have to want to go through again. There's some classes that I don't want to take no more. There's some lessons that I don't want to learn no more. And I don't ever want to walk through those situations again. And by the time that we get to our text, that's where we find David. Because King Saul is so jealous of David that he's obsessed with killing David. And the only thing that Saul wakes up to do every morning is to find and to kill David. But David says no to hurting Saul on at least a two good occasions. When the Lord has delivered Saul into David's hand and David refuses to kill him believing that it's wrong to lay hands on God's anointing. Because David understands that fighting Saul will lead to a war between the men of Saul and the men of David. So in order to avoid a war and killing, a war and killing Saul, David sides with the Philistines. And David believes that if he joins up with the Philistines, that Saul will just leave him alone. So David, his men, and their families go to King Achish of the land of the Philistines, the same place where Goliath is from. And Achish allows David, his men, and their families to live in a town called Ziglag. And in order to prove his loyalty to the, to the Philistines, David and his men attacked certain lands. And when they were able to attack these lands, 
they would come back and tell Achish that they had attacked the lands of Judah in Israel. So Achish would believe that David had turned on his own people. And that is a result, Achish puts his trust in David, even though David is an Israelite who has deflected against the Philistines. And this goes on for about a year and a half. And by this time, the Philistines are ready to go to war with Israel again. And when the Philistine army is coming together to go to war with Israel, Achish shows up on the battlefield with David and 600 Israelites. But y'all, the Philistine army don't want to fight, don't want David fighting with them. And they don't even want his presence in the battle because they don't trust David. And they demand that David and his boys go back to Ziglag. So when they get back to Ziglag, they found out that some Amalekites, whose land they had already attacked, had returned to favor. And verses 1 through 3 tells us that the Amalekites have come to Ziglag, burned the city to the ground, and they have taken captain of the women and the children that David and his men left behind. So y'all, they come back to find their homes destroyed, their wives held hostage, their children taken from their homes. And verse 4 tells us that David and all his men begin to weep. And the Bible says that they cried until they had no more strength. And y'all, if it couldn't get any lower for David, verse 6 tells us that David was in great danger, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in spirit for their sons and their daughters. And now David not only has to deal with his wives and children being gone, but now he has to deal with the truth that his friends were fake and that his enemies are real. He's got to deal with the truth that now his business is in the rumor mill, that his situation is being posted on Facebook, and everybody is talking about David. And somebody here other than David knows what it's like to have a low moment like that in your life, to go through an uncomfortable situation, to go through a personal loss, to have friends turn on you, to have your business hit the rumor mill. And I know that you can't say amen loud, but you can whisper it just a little bit. Because you know what it's like to have some low moments in your life. But y'all in this place of hurt and pain, the Bible tells us that David makes some resolutions that all of us should duplicate in 2020. Because the very first resolution that David makes is that David decides to push through his pain. Tell somebody, push through your pain. Because David decides no matter how much this hurts and no matter how bad it's been, that I'm going to do something about my situation. So watch what happens, because the Bible says that 600 men had lost their wives and their children. And just to be sure that we know that David is not untouched by what's going on around him, verse 5 tells us that David's two wives also had been taken captive. And y'all, what that told me is that what people are going through, that David is going through the same thing. And just because he's the leader doesn't mean that he's not affected with the same pains that the people go through. And just because he has the microphone doesn't mean that he doesn't struggle with the same things that the people in the pew struggle with. Just because he has the title doesn't mean that he doesn't go through the same thing like everybody else. So he's hurt like they are. He's confused like they are. He's mad like they are. But watch how David pushes through. Because verse 6 tells us that the people spoke of stoning David. Now y'all, the people back then, how people are now. They didn't say that to David's face. Because there's a whole lot of people who have the strength to talk behind your back, but don't have enough strength to say it to your face. So they talking behind his back. They have his business out there. But David makes a resolution at the end of verse 6. And the Bible tells us, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Now y'all, in nine words, David ignored the rumors. He rejected his haters and decided that whatever people say about me won't stress me out. Whatever you think about, whatever you think about me won't worry me. And David says, I don't care what you think about me. I don't care what you say about me. I don't care what you post about me, because I will not be stressed out by your opinion. Now y'all, my question is, is how can David ignore what the people are saying? Because David realized that the source of his strength ain't in people. David knows that what makes him up in the morning ain't people. David knows that what got him through the line in the bear wasn't people. David knows that what helped him take out Goliath wasn't people. David knows that what got him through 2019 wasn't people. 
So the source of my strength is not public opinion and what you think about me. Because this same David would sit down in Psalms 27 and write, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And David realized that I can reject what people say about me because the Lord is my light. And y'all, will you know that God is your light? You don't care what other people say about you. Will you know that the Lord is your salvation? You can let people think what they want to think. Will you know that God is your stronghold? Ain't nobody got to like you. Because when the Lord is your strength, what you think about me really doesn't matter. And the Bible tells us that David strengthened himself. Now I need us to follow that sentence makeup in that verse. And somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Because David is the subject. And strengthen is the verb. And himself is the object. So the subject and the object are the same person. So y'all, David strengthened himself. David did it for himself. And David realized if I can't count on nobody else, that I'm just not going to sit here and lay down and die. But it's some stuff that I can do for myself. And if you can't get it from nobody else, you better do it for yourself. You better learn to encourage yourself. You better learn to love yourself. You better learn to take care of yourself. Send yourself some edible arrangements. Take yourself out to eat. Tell yourself how good you look. Tell yourself it's going to be all right. Tell yourself that God is going to make a way. Tell yourself that it won't last always. Tell yourself that you're going to make it through this. Because you got to learn to do it for yourself. Because if there ain't no choir in the stand, can you sing by yourself? If there's no preacher in the pulpit, can you preach to yourself? If there's no crowd to shout with you, can you shout by yourself? Because when you really know God, you shouldn't need a choir. You shouldn't need a preacher. You shouldn't need a crowd. But all you got to do is think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for you. And I'll shout by myself. I'll praise him by myself. I'll dance by myself. I'll bless him by myself. Now, y'all, watch how verse 6 closes out. And I'm about to help three people right up in here. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. So, y'all, David made himself stronger in the Lord his God. He held himself together in the Lord his God. He propped himself up in the Lord his God. Now, usually in the Bible, we can't find a pronoun that takes possession of God like this. Because usually is he strengthened himself in the Lord God. But y'all, David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. And David says, y'all don't know him like I know him. And I ain't mad at y'all about that. But the Lord has shown himself to me. And there's some things that I know about my God, about what he's done for me. And y'all, if you look back over last year, somebody ought to know that he's a healer. Somebody ought to know that he's a way maker. Somebody ought to know that he's a burden bearer. Somebody ought to know that he's a mind regulator. And that's why he wants you to say that he's just a God. You don't to just say that he's any God. You don't to just say he's anybody else's God. But you can stand flat-footed on the first Sunday in January and say that he's my God. And my God will make a way. Now, y'all, if we get that, we won't ever let anybody shut us up in church again. So the next time I stand up from my seat, the next time I'm singing louder than the choir, the next time I shout too loud for you, you can't just shut me up. Because you don't know him like I know him. Because I know what my God can do. And if I was praising him for you, you could tell me what to do. If I was blessing him for you, you could tell me to sit down. So watch what happens in verse 10. But David went on with his pursuit. And the Bible says that God tells David to go pursue them. For you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. So y'all, David brings together all 600 men to go get back their stuff. But when they get to the brook, 200 of them are too tired from crying to cross over. So now David has to make another resolution. Do I stay here with these tired folk? Or do I press on what the Lord has told me to do? Do I stay with them in 2019? 
But do I realize that they are supposed to go with me anyway? And y'all, that's a real word this morning. Because one of the hardest things in life is understanding that everybody ain't qualified to move in the next chapter of your life. Because the folk who were good for us in 19 may not be a part of our assignment in 20. And we have to make a resolution at the brook to either stay here with them or to move on to what God has called you to do. Now watch how David comes to this resolution. And I'm in verse 11. And when he leaves them, he runs up on the Egyptian slave of the Amicalites. And this slave is in the wilderness because his master left him because he fell sick. And verse 13 tells us that he hadn't had any food or water for three days. So now you need to know that if you go three days without water or food, that you can die. So here this man is dying because he hadn't had any water and he has a short time to live. Now here's the beauty in those verses because the slave that is dying knows exactly where the people that David is looking for. And if David stayed with the 200, the slave would have died and they never would have found out where their families were. So David had to make a decision. Do I stay with the people that can't help me do nothing? Or do I go to the one who knows exactly what I need? So y'all, David teams up with the one who can show him where his people are. And when he gets back to the brook in verse 21, the same folk that he left there are still sitting there. Y'all missed that. So he left 200, went and did what the Lord told him to do. And when he came back, the people were still there doing nothing like they were doing before. Now let me tell y'all why that should mess you up. Because Hezekiah Walker has convinced us that I need you and you need me. That we all are part of God's body. And that you ought to stand with me and agree with me. Because we all are part of God's body. And it is his will that we every need be supplied. Because you are important to me. And I need you to survive. But y'all know I don't. I might want you, but I don't need you. You might be important to me, but I don't need you. And as long as I got God in my life, I don't need nobody who's going to bring me down. Tell somebody I love you, but I don't need you. You important to me, but I don't need you. I'll pray for you, but I don't need you. Now here's what I like about David the most. Because David makes his last resolution to give God all the glory. Because the Bible says that David pursues them and they get everything back. All their wives, all their children, all their possessions, and they even got more than that because the Amicalites had attacked Judah. So David had even more than what he lost. And y'all, when David starts to appreciate all that the Lord that gave him in 2019, he's overcome with joy and compassion that's confusing the other people. Because I told y'all that it was 200 men who didn't even fight in the battle. And in verse 21, David resolved to share the possessions with all of them. But the 400 that did fight in the battle, they upset and they say in verse 22, hold on David, because they didn't fight. So they don't deserve any of our stuff. And they stayed in the brook while we put our lives on the line. They took time off while we showed up for the battle. So the 400 are mad with the 200 for not going in the battle. And I want to suggest to us this morning, that it's a sad thing that God wakes up 365 days out of the year and you still got the nerve to be mad at somebody else. Because how can we walk in every good thing that God has blessed us with and still be mad at somebody else? Because whatever they did, whatever they said, whatever they didn't do, can't compare with how God has blessed you in spite of what they did. So the 400 men say they didn't fight with us, David. So they shouldn't get what we got. They don't deserve what we fought for. And they, they tell David in verse 20 that this is your stuff. This is your spoil. And y'all, I like what David says in verse 23. You should not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and handed us over to the raiding party that attacked us. And y'all are talking to me like I think this is my stuff. But when I look back on what I have, when I look back on 2019, I realize that it was God who blessed me. And whatever I have, the Lord gave it to me. That whatever I survive, 
that God brought me through it. That whatever I drive, my name might be on the lease, but God's name was on the title. Wherever I live, my name might be on the mortgage, but God owns the land. Whatever my blessings are, I got enough good sense to look back right now and know that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, and if the Lord hadn't blessed me with it, if the Lord hadn't put it in my hand, then I wouldn't have nothing at all. And whatever is on my resume, God did it. Whatever is in my bank account, God did it. Whatever is in my driveway, God did it. And if it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me where would I be? Now, y'all, I told y'all that every morning at Sports Center comes up with the top 10 sports plays from the night before. And they count down the different moments that happen on the field or on the court. So y'all, I decided in 2020 that every morning that the Lord wakes me up, that I'm going to replay and repeat the top 10 things that God did for me the day before. So number 10, look at the storms that he brought you through. Number nine, count the blessings and name them one by one and see what God has done. Number eight, think about the prayers that he answered when you didn't even know what to pray about. Number seven, remember the doors that God opened when you didn't even know the way could be made. Number six, look at the mess that God cleaned up after you messed it up. Number five, look at the dangers that God kept us through and from. Number four, look at the times that God held you together when life was trying to break you apart. Number three, think about your haters and your enemies and how God shut them up and shut them down. Number two, think about all the days that God woke you up when you weren't worthy to see the sunshine. And number one, think about all the sins that God has forgiven. And y'all, when you think about what God has done, you shouldn't need nobody to tell you how good he is. But you ought to know that he's worthy to be praised. Now you need to know that the top 10 on ESPN, that sometimes people see in sports moments that they think are worthy to be in the top 10. And at the end of the show, if your moment makes it to the top 10, then they'll give you credit for sending it in. So when the top 10 moments have come to an end, you got to watch the credits all the way to the end so you'll know who and where it came from. Because the credits tell you who recorded the moment. The credits tell you who produced the moment. The credits tell you who was holding the camera. And if you don't watch the credits to the end, you won't know who to give the praise to. Happy New Year, progress Progressive. And may the Lord keep blessing y'all real good. But the top 10 moments of 2019 have come to an end. And I want to encourage you right now to go through the credits of your life. And you'll find out to God be the glory. You'll say that God made a way. You'll say the Lord brought me through. You'll say the Lord kept it together. And you'll give God all the credit. God bless y'all.